Good morning, everyone. Welcome to services of the 6th and Washington Streets Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, we're happy to have you with us. I know we have a few distinguished visitors over here on this side. One's still making the rounds with Grandpa somewhere. She'll be back. If you are visiting with us, um, we would ask that you would fill out one of the attendance cards that you'll find in the back of the pew in front of you. Uh, primarily, that's for the, the should contact tracing become necessary. But there's also opportunities if there's anything we can do for you, you can mark those on the cards and you can drop those in the collection basket at the back of the auditorium following services. Those will be taking a public part this morning. Tim Wells will be leading our song service. Harry Ogletree will have our opening prayer. Cohen Eddy will have our scripture, scripture reading. Dennis Dye will lead our minds at the Lord's table. And Roger will be speaking up to us this morning on the concept of solving problems. We'll let Tim get things started. Number three. Number three. from Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 174, 174.
You haven't been with us since we moved to these. We have the, the bread on top. The very first time we used these, I think I was at a lad for leaders convention. I n- totally missed the bread. It, it, it didn't realize it was there. But the, the Sin Still the Same has the bread and, of course, the fruit of the vine underneath. Each Lord's Day, we s- surround this table, you know, reflecting on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And it was the ultimate sacrifice, and, and due to that, uh, Jesus paid the debt uh, of our sins, the, the debt that our sins did create, and, and that's critical for us, absolutely critical. Uh, but was that sacrifice the only sacrifice Jesus made for us? I, you think of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, where Paul's commending the Macedonians. He mentions the very first sacrifice Jesus made for us. He says, For you know the r- grace of our Lord Jesus, that through, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. He left heaven uh, to be born of man, and he had no earth- earthly possessions other than what he wore on his back. And Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And during his teaching ministry, he was criticized in all that he did. He was mocked, he was ridiculed, Accused of many wrongs he did not do. And in the end, even his disciples forsook him and one even betrayed him. But yet, through all that, he stayed faithful to his purpose that he came. And that purpose was the ultimate sacrifice to, to die upon the cross for our sins. He became a, an example in his life for us. And through his death, he saved us. So this time, let's give thanks for the bread. And Father in heaven, we're again thankful in this Lord's Day for the opportunity to assemble together, and especially for this uh, time that we can surround this table and think of Jesus and the sacrifices that he made for us, and especially his death upon the cross, that through that, his shedding of his blood took away the debt of our sin. We're thankful, Father, for his willingness to do that and for your ultimate plan of salvation that uh, enables us to have a home in heaven with you when we leave this earth. Father, we're thankful for this memorial and for this bread, and I ask you to always bless us as we take of it, that we might remember him and that we might encourage us to live our lives closer to the example he set for us. We pray through his name. Amen. Let's continue our prayer for the cup. And Father, we continue thanking you for Jesus again that he shed his blood and that we have this memory of, and reminder of, of the blood that was shed through this cup that we might again be aware of what was done for us and that we might always again encourage us to, to 
live as close to the example he set forth as possible as we spend the time on this earth. Pray this through his name. Amen. also use this time to be mindful of the blessings that Jesus has given us. We have the collection uh, bowls in the back as you come and go in the, during worship. Uh, but let's be thankful for the things that have been blessed to us. Father in heaven, we, we are in our prayer. Thank you for the, the opportunities and blessings and talents and uh, many things you've given us here in this life. We live in a very prosperous time in the history of the world and the We've given, been given many opportunities and talents. We pray that you'd help us to use the talents and opportunities and blessings and uh, resources in a way that uh, would bring glory to you and help our fellow man. Uh, we're thankful for the, the things you have given us and help us always to look to bringing glory to you through the things that we have. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Number 459, 459. before the prayer script reading and lesson will be number 260, 260. If you're able to, please stand. Following the lesson will be number 586. 586.
you pray with me, please? Dear God and Father, we recognize you this morning as the only true living God and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, yea, even the Father of our Lord and Savior. We thank you for this time that we can come together as your people and to worship you, to encourage each other in this precious faith that we share, to be strengthened and guided, to be lights in our communities, and to be good neighbors. When we partake in the worship service and think of who you are and what Jesus did and where he is now, we stand in awe and yet at the same time we realize, dear Lord, that we live and that we should live each day to the full. Help us to be grateful and thankful and yet help us to muster up the courage to live as your people. Wherever we find ourselves and the endeavors that we participate in. And yet, Father, realizing that we're not perfect, our prayer and hope is that we'll grow in faithfulness and we'll grow in maturity in the gospel of our Lord. We thank you for your word that literally is a light in a darkened world that we can see, that we can find our way, that we can find strength when we're weak, that we can find grace in the time of need that we can find instruction on how to love ourselves and how to love one another and how even to treat those, Father, who don't treat us so well. We're thankful for the actual gospel, that is, your power to save not only us but the world. And our prayer and hope is that we will share it in a sincere and honest and faithful way and that when it lands on the hearts of hearers that it will generate faith, and draw people near to you. We know, Father, in a congregation this size that there are people going through a myriad of challenges and struggles, and at the same time, there are a myriad of people who are exuberant and joyful. Our prayer and hope is that we know that Jesus is our high priest and that he's able to pray and take care of each of our needs, but we pray that we also will grow in our faith and summon you in times of joy, in times of struggle, in times of anxiety, and that we can find that peace and joy that's only in Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you for the comfort of our homes. We thank you for the clothes we wear. We thank you for the abundance of food that we all have and pray that we'll be mindful of those around us who do not and do our part in helping them to have that same comfort. We pray, dear Lord, that as we offer up our worship, that we will live lives that are worthy of your calling. We thank you so much for Jesus, for the life that he lived, the example that he set and how he treated the disciples, how he treated strangers, how he treated children, how he even treated those who crucified him. Dear Lord, we pray that uh, we don't understand all the mitigations, but our prayer and hope is that uh, you will bring an end to this virus. Our prayer and hope is that you will help us to trust in you. And at the same time, dear Lord, help us to do all we can to uh, be good neighbors. Help us to be excellent stewards in how you bless us. Help us to be very, very good employees and owners where we work. We thank you so much for the fellowship that we share and we know that it's uh, limited right now because we don't see each other as much as we'd like. But may we all send prayers to and fro and reach out and really know that uh, we're there for each other. We praise you and thank you for this hour of prayer. Our prayer and hope is that it comes up to you as a sweet savor and help us dear Lord to walk out refreshed, yea, even revived. In Jesus name we pray. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. 
And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give us up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man of faith, of the Holy Spirit, and Philip of Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Paramius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Well, good morning. We're grateful for your presence and grateful that we can assemble on the Lord's Day to worship in spirit and in truth knowing that if we follow the guidelines of God's word, we will leave today spiritually enriched and better prepared to serve him in the coming week. I'm told that this should be a national holiday because Madison Smith is celebrating her ninth birthday today. So if you get a chance, wish Madison a happy birthday. I would be remiss before we begin if I didn't mention that Adam, Sarah, and Sydney are with us this morning, and we are so thrilled to have them in our assembly. I seriously considered bringing Sydney to the podium and introducing her to all of you, but then I thought perhaps that would not be the best choice, and so I will simply tell you that they're seated at the front of the building to my left, and I hope you get a chance to, to see her Uh, Please look, do not touch, that's our rule when we're dealing with babies and we will continue to follow that uh, today as always. I must tell you that uh, we feel extremely blessed not simply to have a new granddaughter which has been a really wonderful, wonderful uh, event but to have a daughter-in-law like Sarah I don't think Adam could have done a better job uh, selecting a mate than he did in choosing Sarah. Or if uh, it was the case as it was with Diane, she chased me till I caught her. Uh, I, I'm never sure about those things, but we just count our blessings every day. I cannot tell you how much we love Sarah, and I think you know how much we love our children. They have been topic of discussion from this pulpit in uh, small ways for the last uh, 35 plus years and I don't see that changing as long as I'm able to stand here and speak to you because our family is the second most important thing in our lives. Our faith comes first and that ought to be obvious. Family is a close second, and we are just really blessed, and you all have been a part of uh, our family's development, and I cannot express to you uh, sufficiently how much your love and encouragement over the years has meant to us, and I know that many of you have rejoiced with us as Sydney came on the scene and uh, will continue to do so, and I can't thank you often enough for that. Commercials out of the way, we can turn to our study this morning. As you probably know, if you've been coming regularly, we are engaged in a study of the book of Acts. There are 28 lessons in this particular study, and I hope that you'll find them spiritually enriching. We have learned thus far of the birth of the church at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We immediately followed the birth of the church with the devil's efforts to destroy her, persecuting the saints, Peter and John, and John in particular, who are arrested for, of all things, making a lame man walk in the name of Jesus. A man from birth who had been unable to walk 
because of the power of our Lord, was made whole. And the response was to incarcerate Peter and John. That happened late in the evening, so the following day they appear before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, and they make their defense. And the essence of their defense was, how can you find fault with what we have done? And they really couldn't. What they found fault with is they're attributing the miracle to the master. They were beaten, charged not to make mention of Jesus anymore in the city, and were released. Into the story, or so you might think. But then we learn in chapter 5 that all 12 are arrested. They're threatened and incarcerated. But an angel of the Lord released them. Every time I read that story, I'm reminded of Star Wars and the Jedi mind trick. And if you don't understand Star Wars and you read the text, it may not come to you. But I read that, and for some strange reason, the way my mind works... The angel releases them without arousing anyone in the prison. The guards are oblivious to what happens. And normally when men are released from jail, they flee. They get as far away as they can. But in this case, they are right back at the temple in the morning preaching Jesus when they're arrested again. They're beaten and charged to preach no longer in the name of our Lord, but their response was very simply, we've got to obey God rather than man. And the principle is still valid, folks. We must obey God's law. It cannot be overruled. And our attitude ought to be the attitude of the twelve. When God has spoken, we will obey Man's rule does not overrule God's law. And I gave you, in the course of our study already, a number of applications as to how that impacts us spiritually today in relationship to gender, to marriage, to the sanctity of life, and a host of other issues. And as Christians, we need to be conscientious in holding God's law above man's law. And I reminded you in the process that as Christians, we are the best citizens that any nation can have. And our responsibility to our government in relationship to our greater responsibility to God is this. We are to pay, to pray, and obey with the one exception, those laws that are contradicted by God's law. And I don't know how to state it any clearer, uh, and in doing so, I'm simply acknowledging what we find in Acts chapters 3 through 5. We're now in chapter 6, and the church began at Pentecost with about 3,000 baptisms. Soon the number, Luke tells us, is 5,000, not counting the women, and now the reference is to the church multiplying. Some have estimated that there were between 30 and 40,000 Christians in Jerusalem as the events of Acts chapter 6 unfold. And what do we find as chapter 6 unfolds? A problem within the church. Grecian widows are being neglected. Now understand that at this juncture in the history of the church, all of those who are Christians are from a Jewish background. The first Gentile convert doesn't come on the scene till Acts chapter 10. And so the, the Greek or Hellenist Christians in the church in Acts 6 are those that come from the larger Roman Empire and are not native to Palestine. They speak the Greek language as their daily conversation unfolds. And the other segment is the Jewish Christians from Palestine who spoke Aramaic, the language of that day, a dialect of Hebrew. And they are naturally divided between the Jewish Christians that are native to Palestine and the Jewish Christians that live elsewhere in the empire. But they're all part of the same church as we are today. 
And one of the great lessons that you learn as you read of the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels and see the record of the early history of the church unfold in Acts is that God is no respecter of persons. And as people of God, if we follow the example of our Lord and the admonition of His Word, like the Father in heaven, we do not judge people on the basis of externals. Because the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So God's people follow that example. And we understand that the real measure of anyone is not on the surface, but what's on the inside. This is sometimes forgotten in our modern culture. It can't be justified on the basis of God's word. These were all Christians, and I would suggest to you that the problem that developed was not intentional, but accidental, and probably based on the fact that we're dealing with a large segment of society at this time. That's all right. It was working, Kurt, when we started this morning, buddy. I don't know what's going on now. Probably updates again. So we have a situation where the church is dealing with its first major problem impacting the whole congregation. And I would submit to you that it's not a flawed plan that has produced this problem, but a flawed man. People are imperfect, and anything that is made up of people is inevitably going to have to deal with problems. This problem is significant because an element of the church in need was being neglected. Grecian widows were not being properly supported. Why is that a major problem? Well, if you know anything about the Word of God, you know that God has always demanded of His people care for the less fortunate. Under the law, when you gleaned a field, you didn't glean the corners. If you dropped something, you left it on the ground. When you collected your olives, harvested your olives, you didn't take every olive on the tree. You left some for the poor. And when you look at the prophets and their indictment of Israel and their sins over and over again, and Amos comes to mind immediately, the people of God are singled out and condemned because they sell the, the poor for a pair of shoes. They oppress the widow and the orphan. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16, Paul writes specifically to the church's responsibility to care for those who have no one else to care for them. Now, let me stop and remind you that he said, if there is a widow within your midst, she is to be cared for by her children or her grandchildren. But if she has neither and she meets the qualifications, including being 60 years of age or older, then the church has a responsibility to see that those needs are met. In James chapter 1, verse 27, James said, Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The word visited there is from the same Greek word that we get episkopos, the word for bishop or overseer. He's not talking about our responsibility to make social calls. He's talking about our need to see the needs of the less fortunate and address those needs. And we can't do that in words alone. In fact, John in his epistle in 1 John 3, 17 and 18 reminds us if we see somebody in need and our response is, and I'll just paraphrase, I'm sorry, I hope things get better, and then we go on our way. John wants to know, what good have we done? And then he says, my little children, his favorite endearing term for the brethren, my little children, let us not love in word and in tongue, that is exclusively, but in deed and in truth. 
I've told you in other settings dealing with different topics that it is important to express our love to those around us. I've reminded husbands on more than one occasion that you need to tell your wife, I love you. There are three words she'd rather hear, but you need to tell her, I love you. And if you're wondering what those three words are, eat out tonight. But not only do you need to say it, you need to back it up with action. When the problem is called to the attention of the apostles, their response is, it's not our place to serve tables. We need to be in the Word, teaching the gospel. After all, the primary work of the church is not to care for the less fortunate. Should we do that? Absolutely. But the primary work of the church was, is, and will always be the proclamation of the gospel. Up until this point, that was something that seems exclusively within the realm of the twelve. It will soon change. But rather than be taken away from their primary responsibility to serve tables, they offered this solution. You see, problems lead to solutions and therefore can be beneficial. Look out among you seven men. Specific qualifications are set forth. They need to be filled with the Spirit. They need to be men of, of good repute, respectable, well thought of within the congregation and the community. Men of God, if you please. You notice the apostles did not make that selection. They left that to the congregation. I have for how many years now been pleading with you for additional elders and deacons to serve and lead this church. It is not my role to make those selections. It is not the role of the elders to make those selections. That's the responsibility of the church. And when there are qualified men, and there, there are, they need to engage in the service of God because their soul and the souls of others are at stake. The qualifications for elders and deacons are spelled out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I would urge you to consider seriously how you can serve the Lord in one of those capacities. And when opportunity arises, accept the challenge and serve. They found seven men. I'll not read the text and highlight all. I'll simply tell you that leading the list is Stephen, followed by Philip, and then the other five, which you're able to read at your leisure later today. Interestingly, they're all Greek names. Whether they all came from that segment of the church that had its roots outside of Palestine, I can't tell you with any degree of certainty, but I find that interesting that these are all Greek names and it's Grecian widows that are being neglected. And among them is a man by the name of Stephen, whose story will conclude chapter 6 and entail all of chapter 7 and will be the basis of our study next Sunday morning, God willing. What I can tell you is that all seven were fully qualified. All seven were prepared to serve. All seven will do diligently what God has called them to do in the church. And their work is important. I think it is an oversimplification of the story to suggest that the work of the twelve was more important than the work of the seven because for the welfare of the entire congregation everybody needs to be engaged and working. One of the fundamental stories of scripture especially in relationship to the church in the New Testament you see this in Romans chapter 10 through 12 you see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that all of us have something to contribute and I'm not talking about money here. Money is easy to raise but getting people to discover their talent, their God-given ability or abilities, and utilize them in the service of the king, that's a different story. We'd rather write a check and give our money than give ourselves. Thankfully, that wasn't the case with these seven. Certainly not the case with Stephen. 
because from serving tables, he moves, I can't tell you how quickly, but obviously as the narrative unfolds, fairly quickly from being one who's dealing with the needs of the Grecian widows to one who is performing miracles. This seems to have been the result of the apostles laying their hands on these seven. He's casting out demons. He's doing wonderful things, and this is giving him the opportunity to share the story of Jesus. Well, what have we learned thus far happens when people begin to preach and teach our Lord? Like Peter and John in Acts 3 and 4, like the 12 in Acts 5, they find themselves in hot water in a hurry. Now, what is the problem with proclaiming Jesus? Jesus is the one who said, you know you need to treat people the way you want to be treated in life. Matthew 7, 12. How can anyone find fault, honestly find fault with that? It was Jesus who said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. How can anybody be critical of that? It is Jesus who calls for men to be salt and light in a world that desperately cries out for both. How can you be critical of that? It was Jesus and Jesus alone who lived the perfect life, did no sin. Guile was never found in his mouth. Did he face temptation? Absolutely, as all of us do. But he never surrendered. Hebrews 4.15 and for it, they nailed him to a cross. As Dennis said, the real sacrifice began when he left heaven and came into this world as a babe, the child of peasant parents, destined to suffer and die on a cross. Philippians 2, 1 through 8. The Son of God agreed to become the servant of man and ultimately the savior of man. If he could make that kind of sacrifice for us, how can we refuse any sacrifice that we may be called to make in his service today? From a personal perspective, I don't see how knowing the story of Jesus that we can honestly say no to his demands upon our hearts and lives. It seems these seven understood that, accepted the call, and did what they could to serve our Lord by serving others. Because the simple fact of the matter is, you cannot serve God or Christ today without serving the people around you. That was the message of the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You help others, you're helping the master. You turn your back on others, you're turning your back on Jesus. Stephen got that. And so he willingly served. He cared for Grecian widows. He did those miraculous things that could be done in the first century that can't be done any longer. And he faithfully proclaimed God's word. And so he's, as we would say today, called on the carpet for it. He will have to make his defense before the Sanhedrin. And what do you discover when he stands before this body of Jewish leaders that he speaks the truth with kindness and clarity without hesitation acknowledging that Jesus truly is Lord. When Peter and John made their defense Acts chapter 4 the record says that the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, took note of them that though they were uneducated men, they had been with Jesus. You see, their words were irrefutable. No argument that they could level against Peter and John would stick. Now again with Stephen, 
it seems that the same situation has occurred. What do the critics do? They pay people to lie. Money talks. Did then, does now. And often people are much more comfortable with the lies than with the truth. Stephen had said nothing against the law of Moses and nothing against God, though they said he is a blasphemer. And he holds up Jesus, a man who said he would destroy the temple and build it again in three days, which he never said. Jesus did tell the disciples as he stood on the Mount of Olives and looked toward the temple that the day would come when that temple would be destroyed not one stone would be left upon another. But he never said, I'll do that. And it happened at the hands of the Romans in 70 A.D. What he had said is destroy this temple, not I will destroy it, you will destroy this temple, and it will be raised again in three days in John chapter 2. And John says he spoke of the temple of his body. Jesus actually obeyed every precept, every command of God in the law. And during the course of his ministry, encouraged others to do the same. He never spoke ill against the temple. He merely acknowledged that it would be destroyed. And Stephen accurately represented the message of the master. But they lied and accused him of things that he had not done and had not said. And this will give him opportunity to make his defense. We'll read about that defense and the message that flowed from his lips in chapter 7. But what is so striking to me is what is said in the last verse of chapter 6. And gazing at him, this is the Sanhedrin, looking at Stephen, and gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai? There 40 days... The record says he didn't eat and didn't drink. And when he came down, his face literally glowed. He had to go around for a while with a mask on his face. Isn't it interesting how history repeats itself? Only ours is for a different reason. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17, conversing with Moses and Elijah about his impending death, Jesus literally, we would say, glowed. Is that what we're talking about here? I don't think so. What I believe that the record is recording and the council observed is the serenity of Stephen before his accusers. Over the last perhaps three decades, maybe slightly more than that, the health and wealth gospel, or what is currently referred to as the prosperity gospel, has really come to the forefront. I could give you names that you would easily recognize of men and women who are advocates, advocates of this health and wealth or prosperity gospel. But I think the true outcome of the gospel of Jesus Christ is better illustrated in the story of Stephen than anything the so-called prosperity preachers have to share. When you read the Gospels and listen carefully to the words of Jesus, what you find over and over and over again is a reminder from the Master that if you follow me, it will not be easy. In Luke 14, he says there's a cross to be born. In Matthew 10, he talks about how divisions would develop within families because of him. Fathers and sons and mothers and daughters will be separated because of the Savior. The Beatitudes conclude with blessed 
are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Persecution is the inevitable lot of those who follow the master. And Stephen clearly illustrates this principle in the face of his accusers with perjurers proclaiming, putting words into his mouth that he never uttered. He will ultimately become the first Christian martyr. In all probability, he knew as he stood before this body of 70 men that his time was limited. And yet his face was as the face of an angel. What does that tell me? That Stephen experienced what all of us can experience as people of God. What Paul called in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7, a peace that passeth understanding. I want us to know that if we are faithful to our Lord, that there are crosses that we must bear. There are burdens that must be borne. There are difficulties that we will face because we follow him. But we can still possess that same peace that passes understanding. And in the midst of the trials and tribulations of discipleship, have a face like Stephen, the face of an angel. I want to close with a reading from 1 Peter chapter 4 which seems to summarize the essence of what we learn in Acts 6. Beloved, that's all of us today. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. Today, you have to be very careful what you say. Our politically correct environment limits what you can say of a critical nature about anyone or anything except Christians. I submit to you, based on what I read in the Word of God, that it's not going to become easier but harder and harder to maintain our alliance to the Lord in the onslaught of persecution, ridicule, and punishment that follows people of God. And when it comes and you're called upon to suffer for the name of Jesus, don't think, Peter says, that it's a strange thing. He may have been thinking of Paul's words to Timothy, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then he continues, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God on this behalf or in this name. I want you to remember Stephen to remember his example, to remember the peace that he possessed and know that when difficult times come, we can share that same peace. And our response to adversity, to persecution, is to rejoice that we too can suffer for the name of Jesus. That's the message for the church. We are that church. And I don't know what the future holds in detail, but I can tell you that we live in enemy territory. I say it over and over again. The God of this world is Satan, but we do not serve him. We serve the risen Lord. And if we are faithful to him, he will never leave us. We'll stand at our side through thick and thin and enable us someday to stand in the presence of God eternally. That's what we have as Christians. That's what Peter John, 
and the others had. It's what Stephen had as he is persecuted for his faith. When the time comes for you to stand for the Lord, will you share that same peace? Will people see in your face the face of an angel? Will you rejoice that you've been counted worthy to suffer in the name of the Master? Thus is the direction God's people ought to go. And the challenge every day is to live so others see him living in us. If you're doing that, God bless you and keep on. If you're not, it's time to start. If you're outside of Christ, you can come in response to the invitation song to confess your faith in Jesus from a penitent, believing heart, and we'll immerse you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins, and Jesus himself will add you to his church. If you've done that and you've lost your way and you need to get back on the right path, you can do that today. Maybe you're like Simon that we'll read about in Acts 8 who will say, pray for me, and we will. God's promised to hear and answer our prayers, but we must seek him and seek him on his terms. You have that opportunity today, right now. Will you come as we stand and sing? Have thine affections been now to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Dost thou count all things for Jesus by loss? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson blood, Swiss and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Has the dominion, nor self and nor sin, is thy heart right with God? Without and within, is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson blood, swiss and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. I are thy powers under Jesus' control, is thy heart right with God? Does each moment abide in thy soul? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson blood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Closing song will not be in the book. Well, thank you, Roger, for an excellent message. I have a comment for him specifically, but I'll save that for afterward. He'll appreciate it. Some announcements to share with you. Among our sick. Tim McNutt, that's Jennifer's father-in-law, is in memorial dealing with COVID. At OSU is Dana Holland, that's Janet Antle's brother. Uh, we've been announcing that Don and Dolores Bagley have been having challenges, first in the hospital and then at Belfry Landings. Don is now at home, and Dolores may be coming home either today or Monday. So that's good news, both improving. Ned Urschel, that's Bev Dollison, Sharon Coulter, and Sarah Schaefer's brother, is also now at home. As a reminder, we'll be holding our annual men's business meeting following services this morning. We'll stay here in the auditorium for that. Invite you back every opportunity you have to be with us. Wednesday evening at 7, we will continue our study of personal evangelism. And following our final song this morning, Adam Burkhart will lead our minds the closing prayer. We'll let Tim resume. We'll sing all four verses. If you're able to, please stand. Mm -hmm. Lord, dismiss us. 
Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this hour of worship when we meet here, sing praises to you, pray to you, and hear another lesson from your word. Pray, Father, that you will be with all of those who have mentioned as being sick, strengthen them, strengthen their families. Be with us all now as we leave this place and keep us safe. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs> 